Hello, welcome to The Christian Contrast, where we talk about how walking with Jesus leads us to live differently than the world around us. I'm Dan, and I'm joined this week by Greg Brown. Excited to be able to have this conversation with you today, Greg. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. So Greg's wife, Summer, is our women's ministry pastor. Um, And also, Greg, you've been pastor, missionary, just finished your DM lately, and so or D men. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess I'm just saying this guy is qualified to be able to talk about the Bible <laughs> right now, not just a friend of mine that I wanted to bring on the podcast. <laughs> well, thanks, I appreciate that. Yeah. But I just love talking about the Bible, so I'm well, excited good. about it. So. <laughs> well, good because that that's what we're going to do. We're, we're talking about we're we're doing these three podcast episodes and talking about some of the theological and doctrinal things in the Bible that are trickier. And that sometimes we can just ignore because we can just say, it's, it's too much for me. I'll just try to worship Jesus. I, I don't want to get into any of this. Um, we talked about election, and we're going to be talking about the Trinity, which in some ways, we, we were just chatting beforehand, is the biggest head scratcher and the easiest one to get daunted by. But you just made the comment also of such profound importance. You know, in, in some ways, what could be more important for us to talk about than the very nature of God? Um, so I thought where we'd start is just by saying, you know, it's, it's well chronicled. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, doesn't show up there. So we don't just turn to a book of the Bible and it tells us here's the Trinity and here's what it means. Um, why then should we still look at the Trinity as something that's a foundational Christian belief? Um, and just for you, what convinces you of the idea of the Trinity, despite the fact that there is no sort of proof text that just lays it all out? Yeah, I mean that's 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 great. That's a great point. I mean, I think for me, it's it's when I approach the conversation of the Trinity, it's it's not so much of, hey, what is this? Why does it exist? Where is it in the Bible? But it's more of like, hey, this is all over the Bible. Hmm. I need to make sense of this now. So it's just kind of it's just built into the fabric of of the Bible. The authors that was where they were thinking, where they were coming from. We see that so clearly. Um, I mean, one of, one of the biggest like low hanging fruit passages, right? Is is the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Like, Mm -hmm. go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's it's, it's just built in. They understood it. They talked about it. They knew it. So it's more of like, okay, now now we need to do our part. (laughs) We need to, like, fully, like, flesh this out. What does it mean? What what, What were they talking about? And, yeah, so, you know, the word Trinity... Sure, that's not that's not a biblical word. It's not in the Bible. It's just what we use to help make sense of it. Yeah, and, and I think you're really right. It is one of those things where once you s- start viewing God through a Trinitarian lens, it's almost like you can't unsee certain things. And even going back into the Old Testament, you know, and people debate it, but going back as early as the first book of the Bible, where you have God creating through his word and the spirit hovering above the waters, and then, you know, let us create man in our image. And and passages where you have God speaking from heaven and the angel of the Lord there and trying to make sense of that. Um, And a lot of it, this is one of the the things about when we think about the Trinity. For me, I always think, we, we think about the Trinity because we're trying to make sense of Jesus, um, largely, where we say, all right, you know, the, the disciples, the apostles have this person that they've interacted with. They've become convinced that he's more than just a man. You know, I mean, the, right before the Great Commission, it talks about in um, Matthew 28, verses 16 and 17, about how they gathered and they worshiped him. Mm. That's not what you did. You know, you even have Revelation where John accidentally does that a couple times with an angel, and the angel's like, get up. That's not appropriate. Um, Jesus never tells anyone, get up, when they're worshiping him. It's a shocking thing. You know, he forgives sins, and they say, only God's allowed to do that. And he's sort of like, yep. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, he says him and the Father are one, right? And so they pick up stones to stone him because he's claiming to be God. Like, yeah, we get all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so you have so you have these apostles saying, Well, all right, he's he's God. We become convinced about that, but he's not all that there is to God because he's praying to the Father this whole time. And he's not just the Father who's come down, he's he's praying to the Father. So Jesus is God, but it, it it's not as simple as just saying God is Jesus. There's something more to this. And so you see, like, like you said, the Great Commission, I mean, is, is a great example of sort of that Trinitarian formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then you have different passages that it sort of is, is just mentioned in passing as if it's become a creedal idea. Um, like I, I'd written a couple of them down. You get 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, about spiritual gifts. 
There are many kind, different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are many different kinds of services, but the same Lord, which is usually a reference to the Lord Jesus. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Father, Son, Spirit. Um, Second Corinthians, he loves to do these in the Corinthians. Last verse of Second Corinthians, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Um, and even with, with talking about all this, you, you know, some people, I, I always say, you know, what if Paul had written, um, may the grace of the Father and the love of the Son and the power of the Archangel Michael be with you? We would be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like that's, those are three important beings, but that's not appropriate. And yet he's got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That There is that sort of togetherness that just seems to be baked into the creedal statements that are being made throughout the New Testament. Yeah, I mean, we see that all, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just so built in, right? It's just the fabric of what it is. And so, like, how do, we, how, do we, how do we understand that? In Trinity, right, the tri-unity, like, what, what are some of our attempts to really put together? What does this mean? How do we understand the nature of, of God? And, and I, I think... It's bigger than that, right? Like when it comes to like doctrine in general, I think doctrine seeks to answer like the big three questions, right? Hmm. Like, um, and, and no matter what your your faith background is or non faith background, I think you I think you ask the same questions in different ways, obviously. But it's like, who is God? Who am I? And then how do I relate? Hmm. How do those two relate? And so it might be, hey, who's the universe or who's the greater power or whatever. But wh- who is God? Who am I? And how do they relate? And the Trinity seeks to give us this help answer some of those questions right yeah. it builds this framework for how we how we view the world how we view ourselves how we view those those two together and helps answer some of those big questions yeah well, well let's talk we, we we don't want to spend lots of time sort of on the negative but let's talk talk a little bit just about maybe some ways we can get off the rails and talking about the trinity um you know i, I think when we're talking about most theological or, or sort of doctrinal issues um, we can get off the rails when we try too hard to simplify. Mm. Like there's a lot of simple, you know, with the Trinity, you can get simple answers and simple explanations that aren't right. Um, you know, we, we joke about the the water, sort of the H2O, you know. All right, water, ice, steam, three kinds of water, that three kinds of sort of expressions of water. Or people will use the, you know, all right, I'm Dan, um, I'm a father, and I'm a husband, and I'm a pastor. Um, so sort of there's three roles that I play, and we'll try to relate to the Trinity that way. It's like, well, both of those are easy to understand, but neither of those is biblically <laughs> accurate. Sure. Um, because it's not just the idea that, all right, well, well, God was the Father, and that's sort of what the world needed for a while, and then the world needed him to be the Son, so he changed and came down as the Son, and then he left and came back as the Spirit. And so it's like, well, if that was the way it was, it'd be easy to understand. Yeah. But it's definitely not biblically correct at all, because you got the Father praying to the Son, and the Son talking about sending the Spirit, and even the Son being filled with the Spirit during his life. And so it's much more complex when we get into these. Um, Part of it, we'll get into this more, but part of, I think, the difficulty maybe for the average person in looking at this and saying, God being three in one, and one God and three persons, it it feels like such a mind-bender that the question of why... Like, why even go into this? Why not just say, all right, I, I sort of believe that that's out there. I'm not even going to try to figure it out. Um, why is the doctrine of the Trinity, maybe apart from just saying it's in the Bible, um, why is it so significant? Why does it? Because you've talked about it, sort of paint how we understand all of reality. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it's this huge, huge topic that I actually think is it's easier than we... we paint it to be like it's it's really not a, dis, a difficult topic to explain it's just difficult to grasp right <laughs> it's like like when we really start to think about it we stay up at night it's like wow i can't i can't wrap my ra- mind around yeah. this right like god is bigger than my understanding which is a god that i want um <laughs> but I, th- I think um yeah i mean some some of the big things right like we need to understand the trinity because this is, this is this is god it, it creates it's part of framework and how we read the bible how we understand ourselves and, and god and um it's also something that that distinguishes Christianity from other religions. Absolutely. So our view of God is very unique. Um, you know, when we get the Trinity wrong, then it puts us into different categories. Um, it puts us into maybe Mormonism or uh, Jehovah's Witness or Islam. Um, it could put us into, I mean, all the things. Um, 
we, we need to be careful of being polytheistic, you know, mm-hmm. believing in lots of gods. We want to stay monotheistic. And so we kind of had to, had to, you know, walk through some of that. But like I said, on the basis, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Like there's one God. We believe in one God. There's one God, one being, um, but there's three persons. And those, those persons are unique, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, they're not separate. They're, they're unified. They're one. Um, one in being, three in person. Yeah. How does that play out, right? <laughs> and one of the things, you know, I, I was talking a few minutes ago just about, all right, there's bad analogies of the Trinity. You know, I mean, the egg, the water, all of that. Um, th- there's a few that are kind of upheld as like, all right, these are not perfect. There's no perfect analogy for the Trinity, but these are maybe upheld as like, these are ones that are not terrible, you know, might still help us. Um, and at least you, you might've run across others, but, but to me, the biggest one that always comes up is Augustine's, um, analogy about love, um, that it, it, and it's sort of the idea of that within a love relationship, you have the lover. So the one that's giving the love, you have the beloved, the one who's receiving that love, and then you have the love that they share. And the idea is that that's an analogy for the Trinity, which to me, the reason I like that better than any other analogy is because I see just a lot of grounding in scripture of that idea where Jesus is frequently even called the beloved. Um, and in fact, if you, read, if you read the New Testament, and in particular, if you read the Gospel of John, you have Jesus talking a lot about how the Father loves him, and he talks a lot more about how the Father loves him than about how he loves the Father. Mm-hmm. It's like, he does love the Father, but that's not how it's framed. Yeah. It's, it's framed much more primarily as the Father is the one who is loving him. And the first time I heard the analogy, I was like, well, I don't like that at all, because the Spirit <laughs> is sort of just this thing then, you know, just this love, this sort of force, which we know that that's not the idea. The Spirit can be grieved, and the Spirit can be quenched, and the Spirit is teaching us. Um, but even though it's not a perfect analogy and no analogy is perfect, the, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, that there is something to that because the spirit is a, is a communicator in many ways. And so there is something to that idea of almost the love being a separate entity that's shared between the father and the son. Um, and the other reason I like that is because it's relational. Sure, it, yeah. You know, I mean, what, one of the beautiful things, and, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this is just that part of what the Trinity tells us is that God is relational and that he was a relational being long before we even showed up. And so even thinking about something, you you talked about those three big questions when we're asking, who are we? Like, Mm -hmm. what are we as human beings? Well, we're told we're created in the image of God and that's not spelled out for us. But if we're created in the image of a triune God and there's love and harmony and relationship, and there's unity but distinction in some way that we can't quite spell out, but we know is there, that tells us something about the relational nature that we're created with. Going back as far as it's not good for man to be alone because we're created in the image of a God who's not alone. Yeah, right, you have this like community built in, and if we have this perfect harmony and unity in God, then when when you get to those questions like, okay, why did God need to create me? Well, if God has perfect unity, he didn't. Right. <laughs> right? And so it wasn't it, out of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> and so so that it, it has a whole different you have a whole different take when you look at, okay, what's my purpose? Like I still have value, but what's my purpose? What's hmm. it, what's it look like? And how do I seek unity for myself and how do I how do I play out being an image image bearer of, of the Lord and what's that look like? Um, but you know, going back to those those analogies, like you said there's no there's no perfect analogy, right? right? We're trying to describe um a, a unique being, God, <laughs> that there's no one like him. There's no one apart from him. He's, he's alone. So there's going to be no analogy that's going to fit it perfectly. And so I, I think, I think analogies can be helpful to help right. us, right? Help us like fully like grasp this concept. But I think it's good, like, like you said, to have this concept of this, there's not going to be a one for one. No. Right? Like yeah. God is, God is unique and, and separate and it's not going to be the same, but it is, it can be helpful. Yeah. And one of the things just in terms of, you know, and this is the whole idea of just one of the things that's meaningful to me in thinking about the Trinity is the, that idea that you already alluded to, that God doesn't need me, Mm -hmm. which in some ways can be, you know, there can be sting to that initially, you know, depending on how you think of yourself to be like, oh, like God didn't create me because either he was like, I'm, I'm incomplete without humanity, you know, and Dan Franklin in particular, like I'm incomplete unless I create this 
person that I need to help bring me something that I don't have otherwise. Um, and I was thinking, you know, John 17 is um, sometimes it's called the great high priestly prayer of Jesus, where the son is praying to the father and praying about the disciples. And he says, I'll, I'll read verses 20, I guess, 24. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, which is awesome because Jesus prayed for us. Um, he says that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. And there's just these constant references to the father-son relationship goes back to all eternity. Sure. And there's this amazing thing where he's talking about believers somehow being brought in. You know, we, we talk about being adopted into the family of God. We're being brought into something that precedes us. Um, and I was trying to think of the best way to talk about this in, in a way that wouldn't be negative. But, you know, sometimes because of the culture that we live in, um, you'll have maybe, a, you know, like a, a career woman in, in her 30s or 40s, unmarried, just decide, I just, I want to have a kid. Um, you know, maybe like no husband, no, no man in the picture, but just, I want to have a kid, which in some ways is a natural thing. You know, a, a lot of us say, yeah, I, I want to have a kid. And so whether it's through in vitro fertilization or adoption, just to say, all right, I'm, I'm just going to bring a, a kid into my family. Um, and while sometimes there can be beauty in that, you know, sometimes single people do adopt children. So I, I'm given all of these qualifications, you know, like, so, <laughs> yeah. but but for me, one of the things that I think of in cases like that, that that seem less healthy is to think, man, that's a lot of pressure on that kid. Like, here is this person that's like, I want this in my life and I don't have a husband and I'm not going through it sort of the conventional way. Think of the pressure on that kid to, to be something that completes that person. And just the idea that when, when you have a kid born into a normal family, um, there can be certainly dysfunction and all of those things, but God willing, what you have is you have a man and a woman who love each other and already are a family and the kids being invited into that. Um, and the kids being now included in this thing that preexisted them is still going to be around when they go off to college or when they move off or, you know, go and have a family of their own. And just the amount of security that that brings in the idea of saying, okay, you know, it would, father, son, and Holy spirit, I am not the one holding this show together. Mm -hmm. Like my behavior, my, my failure, you know, when I give in to lust or anger or wh whatever it is, when I fall flat, um, nothing about God hangs in the balance because this is far bigger than I am. And I'm being really invited into, again, no perfect analogy, but sort of being invited into a family that's already in existence, sure. a relational God inviting me in, and I don't have the weight of the world saying, I, I'm upholding even half of this relationship. This is already, it's, it's going to precede me, it's going to be around after me, and I'm invited to be a part of something that's so profound and so beautiful, and that there's perfect harmony that I get to get in on. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's the difference between a God that needs you versus a God that wants you. Absolutely. Right? When I was when I was little, I have an older sister and, you know, sibling sibling things, obviously, you know, like my older sister was the was the bigger, older, like, would pick on me and stuff. And so and um, we had a great relationship, but one day she came up and said, you know, I love you because I have to. <laughs> and and then she That's what everybody <laughs> wants to hear. Right? Right? I love you because I, mean, I have to. You're oh, my thank little brother. You. I have to love you. But I like you too. <laughs> and and that changed everything oh. for me. Like it was like Oh, my sister likes me too. You know, like she's got to love me. She doesn't have a choice in that matter. <laughs> but I think there's some of that like, hey, God doesn't need us. Yeah. But he, he wants us and he chose to love us and, and not just love us, like adopt us in. Like you're saying, like this family and and we get to share in this inheritance and this, this you know, this glory that, that God has. So yeah, that's, that's a cool thing. It is. When you think, it, I'm curious for you, just when you think about it, what for, for just the average believer that maybe is feeling like, this is too much. I don't even want to think about this because this is just too big an idea. What what do you long for sort of 
the average Christian just to know or embrace or do in response to the idea that, like you said, we, we have a unique thing about our faith, that God is triune. But what do you long for people to take in and respond to that with? So I think there's a couple of different parts of that. So, I mean, the first one I think I think the longing I have is is that people have a, a, a true grasp of what the Trinity is. And then and then from that respond. Um, but I think that foundation has to start, right? Mm. Um, you know, we, we need to know that the characteristic the characteristics of God, the attributes of God, those are really important. But we also know, you know, like who who is God? Yeah. And if God is, you know, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, this one being that exists in three persons, and in each part of the Trinity is fully God. Um, so if you know, if the Son is fully God, and the Holy Spirit is fully God, and the Father is fully God, and they exist as one being, but they're separate persons, that's important. That's important to know. And then and then you respond based on that. And and that that's part of everything, right? It's how we read our Bible. It's how we hmm. it's how we pray. Um, it's how we share our faith. It's how we worship. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many, how many songs you, you too, that you've heard that's like, well, I don't know if that's doctrinally correct. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, like it's, it's a great song and it sounds really good, but like, you know, we're, maybe we're worshiping, Hey, I love, I, I love you God when you were the father and I loved you God when you were the son. Like, well, that's, you know, we were talking a little bit about this yeah. before earlier. It's like, like, where is that line of, of grace versus where God's grace meets my ignorance right. and, and how much I, I know about him? And, and is, that, is that worship of a false God acceptable to the true God? Like, where does that, where does that line hit? But so, so for me, I think it's, it starts with, like, hey, let's seek to know the God that is beyond understanding, that has given us an, an opportunity to know him. Like, I just, I love, you know, in Ephesians, it says, like, you, that you can have the love that surpasses hmm. knowledge. Like, hey, there's, there's, there's a part of God that's not knowable, but God's going to make a way for us to know it. Like, there's a, there's a miracle happening, happening yeah. there. And I think that's, that's part of it. Like, hey, let's, let's, have a, let's have an opportunity to know what can't be known about God. Hmm. And, and from that, respond. Respond um, in worship and love and through evangelism and prayer and, and all the things. Yeah. No, I, I think that's good. And, and just taking in that idea that God, that as you just said, it truly is a miracle to be able to know that God. And, and I also think you, you said something that I thought was cool, that um, this is not, the Trinity is not just sort of one of 27 characteristics of God. It, it sort of gets away from the what to the who. It's like, at a foundational level, this is who God is. Um, now, it's also true that he's all-knowing, and it's also true that he's all-powerful, but, but even more so, the Trinity is not just one of the, the, the attributes. It's, it's the foundation of who he is yeah. as a person. And you think of that, you know, like he, each of us is married, and you think of the idea of, of wanting to, to know your spouse um, and not just know, like, oh, this is her hair color, and this is her eye color, and these are her favorite, you know, kind of clothes to wear, but to know them at a deep level like that and, and to be known at that level also okay. is something that is deeper. And so for us thinking about God and, and again, thinking of bringing it outside of, um, of just the idea of we're sort of on, on a fact finding mas- mission, which I think is one of the implications of the Trinity to think, all right, if we're created in the image of God and God is relational at the very core of who he is, that not just as, yeah, that's there too, but at the core of who he is, that says something about us. Um, and thinking, you know, of wh- wherever we are in the whole COVID thing, e- even before COVID, there's just this growing sort of isolation that we have where, you know, we can, we can work from home, we can have food delivered to us, we can be entertained, not by even going to a theater or a play, but just by you know, being on our phone, even away from our family, that just the pull for isolation is so strong. And as Christians, then we th- can think, well, I'm, I'm going to listen to good podcasts and I'm going to still kind of get the information and listen to the music. But the idea that part of how God has created us is that we're meant to be within community with one another. And that it's, it's, I think that there's a reason why solitary confinement is like the, this ultimate horrific inhuman of punishment that we give people because we're like God in that way. 
where we're created to be in community with one another. And um, I, I don't know if this is the case. I don't know if anybody's listening to this and is kind of like, eh, I don't know that I'll ever go back to church because I can listen to great sermons online and I can listen to great Christian music. Um, I guess I just want to take a moment to say you're created to be in community with people, um, yeah. to, to be in small groups, to be in friendships, to be in family, to, to be worshiping side by side. Like this, this past Sunday, um, I, I was in the nine o'clock service and I totally lost it during the music time. Like I was trying to collect myself because I just, I started crying because I was looking around and I was seeing people in our congregation that I know, I know to some extent the, the burdens that they're carrying and just how deep they are, that they're not just like, I want to do well on my math test, but people struggling to figure out if they have any value and seeing hands being lifted up in worship to me was was so deeply powerful and thinking, man, I can listen to better sermons than I give and I can listen to better music than we could ever produce. But man, I, I was so glad I was in flesh and blood there on that Sunday to be able to experience something like that. And that's part of the beauty of being created in the image of God is that as much as we can do sort of in our brains in isolation, we're, we're meant for that deep level connection and that's part of, you know, you talked about it. That's part of how we respond. Yeah. That's part of how we evangelize. That's part of how we live out the idea that God is triune and not just an individual in isolation sort of calling down orders. Yeah, we're not, we're not meant to be alone. Yeah. We're not meant to go it alone. And there's parts of the Christian life that we cannot do alone. Absolutely. Like we need each other and um, the community needs you, right? Mm-hmm. The community needs me. That's like right. We need each yeah. other. And, and um I mean, we see that all throughout the New Testament, right? With all these one another passages, like you, like over and over and over again, we're built to reflect the image of God through community. Like if our God, if one, if part of His very nature is unity, then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna need to do that too. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's good. Yeah, I, I love talking about these things. I love it also because you know we we joked. All right, we solved it, guys. <laughs> Everybody listening, you're welcome. We saw <laughs> problem done. Yeah. Yeah. Problem solved. All questions answered. Um, you know, that's obviously not what we're looking to do in half an hour, but, but hopefully given a little bit of help, a little bit of biblical grounding, you know, while the word Trinity is not in the Bible, this is not something that some guy just made up and all of us went along with it. You know, that this is something we find grounded in scripture and not of trivial importance, but of real central importance to how we live and how we interact with one another. Um, so if, if you're listening to this and you have questions and you have thoughts and you're like, hey, what was that passage or what's a good book or something like that, um, feel free to comment on this um, or to contact us just through the church website if you want to. Um, you know, we post episodes of The Christian Contrast every other week, every two weeks. So we'll be back two weeks from now with a new one. Um, we put them up on lbf.church and you can find them on YouTube and also through our app. Um, and we'd love to hear from you on any of these things. And so, Greg, thanks so much for taking the time to have this conversation and just to help us dig into this. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for those of you who listened. Um, We'll see you again in two weeks.